My name is Simon from the Ontario Science Centre. Have you ever walked through a natural history museum and marveled at the fossilized organisms that once inhabited our Earth? We know that these fossils represent species from the past, but how do we know how old they really are? In this video, we hope to answer some of these questions by talking about two methods scientists use to date these fossils. We will invite you to try some of the experiments that represent both dating methods by using some of the everyday materials that you can find in your own home. There are two main ways geologists date rocks, and neither of them involve a dating site. They're called relative and absolute dating. Relative dating compares the age of one fossil to another. For example, I have one fossil here, still here that was found above this one. This one would be younger than this one. Absolute dating determines the numerical age of the fossil. For example, this trilobite here dates back to 520 million years ago. We'll be focusing on how fossils are dated, but these methods are also used for all kinds of rocks. And there's no need to swipe right. Let's start with relative dating. If you've ever been on the highways of rural Ontario, you might have noticed these beautiful rock formations on the side of the road. If you ever had a chance to look closely at these rocks, you'll notice that they are made up of multiple horizontal layers, and these layers are known as strata. The study of how and when these strata are formed is called stratigraphy. This individual rock layers are formed through geological events, such as when layers of sediments are deposited and solidified over time, or large lava flows that would cool. However these layers are formed, geologists can rely on the principles of stratigraphy to date these layers. It is important to note that each individual rock layer and fossils that are within it often take hundreds of thousands of years to form, and those strata take millions of years to develop also. Instead of waiting all this time, let's do a quick activity and make your own strata layers at home. Natural strata would take thousands and millions of years to develop. Now at home, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to start off with a container to hold your sediments and your layers in. You want it to be clear so that you can see those sediments. The next thing is you need something to scoop your sediments into your container with. Uh, and then feel free to explore all the different types of sediments that you have at home. And then the last thing is some cardboard. You're going to cut the cardboard into the same width and the height of your container. This will help us push and move our sediments. I'm going to first start off with cutting the cardboard to the size of my box. You're going to want to make sure that you try to fit the cardboard into the box first and then if you have a chance you give it a little extra so that you have a little handle to push your strata inwards or outwards. We're going to start filling our box but make sure you don't fill it all the way to the top. About half is about right. You don't want to push the layers and have the layers come out of the box. So first thing, I'm going to lay a layer of sand down. You're going to want to lay a good base layer of sand first. Then you can go on in with some other types of sediments. I'm going to go in with some flour next. You're going to want some even layers there. So we have our sand and our flour layer. I'm going to go in with another layer of sand next. For my next layer, I'm going to do a little bit of cornstarch. And I'm going to put one more layer of sand on the top. When we're examining rock layers, we can determine the age of the layers deeper or higher in the rock using a law called superposition. Younger layers are deposited on top of older layers. An easy way to think of this is to imagine a club sandwich. We know the bottom layer of the sandwich, the bread, had to be placed down before the next layer, the lettuce. Otherwise, the lettuce would have nothing to rest upon. In the, my experiment, I laid down the sand first, so it's the oldest layer then the flour. In the rock layers, this process is called sedimentation, and it can take millions of years. So now that we've filled our layers, I used a combination of sand, flour, and cornstarch. But you can do the layers with the sediments that you can find at home too. Now, make your predictions on what's going to happen when we start to move this cardboard over this way. 
Let's try pushing this cardboard over and see what happens. When we compressed the layers in our experiment, we simulated a geological event in which a piece of the Earth's plate pushes against a rock layer. This is known as a reverse fault, or a thrust fault, which also creates mountains. But not all strata are made up of simple horizontal bands. Rock contains large irregular lumps or vertical bands which cut through multiple horizontal layers. These bands are known as igneous intrusions and occur when magma formed inside of the earth pushes through existing rock layers and cools. According to the law of cross-cutting, these intrusions are actually younger than the surrounding rock. At this point, you're probably wondering how all this relates to the age of fossils. Well, fossils are, of course, found inside of rocks, and by dating these rocks, we can date the fossils within it. By determining the order of fossil deposited in the rock layer, scientists can determine the order in which the organism appeared on Earth, allowing us the understanding of how life evolved over time. In stratigraphy, the layers above will often be younger than the layers below. By counting the annual sediment layers and knowing the approximate date of one layer, you can figure out the approximate age of another layer. This is very similar to counting tree rings to see how old a tree is. Like tree rings, however, simply looking at it can't reveal the exact age of the layer of rock or the fossil inside of it. To figure out the rock's actual age, though, we have to turn to chemistry and radioactive decay. In order to calculate the numerical age of a fossil, we have to determine how many of its atoms have transformed over time. This technique is known as radiometric dating or absolute dating. Cosmic rays that are emitted from the sun come into the Earth's atmosphere and bump into the elements that are inside of it. These cosmic rays can form stray neutrons inside of our own atmosphere. Since our atmosphere is mainly made up of 78% nitrogen, one of those neutrons can bump into our nitrogen atom and push out a proton. This forms a radioisotope of carbon called carbon-14. These isotopes have different numbers of neutron than normally expected based on the periodic table, such as carbon having 12 as the atomic weight. Carbon-14 isotopes are unstable and decay into a nitrogen over time to make a more stable atom. It releases an electron and a neutrino. How does carbon-14 get into these fossils? C-14 is found in the atmosphere and from there, it can combine with oxygen and create carbon dioxide. Plants can absorb C14 through carbon dioxide. Animals can get it from eating those plants. When these animals die, they will have a certain amount of carbon 14 left inside them. This isotopic decay happens at a constant rate, which is known as the half-life of a radioisotope. This is the amount of time it takes for half of the isotope to decay into a stable atom, such as this carbon-14 decaying into the nitrogen. By knowing this rate and identifying how many atoms have decayed within the fossil, it is possible to date the fossil. Let's take a look at how half-life works. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years, which means half of these atoms will decay into nitrogen. It will take another 5,730 years for half of these remaining to decay also. And another 5,730 years for half of these to decay too. The ratio of isotopes to stable elements within a fossil or any geological sample is known as the isotopic ratio. The isotopic ratio is then compared to the ratio found on the Earth's surface. If a fossil contains 50% of carbon-14 versus the ones that are found on the Earth's surface, then it's roughly 5,730 years old. For our next experiment, we're going to be experimenting with the half-life of foam or bubble. My source of foam and bubble today will be chocolate milk. And what we'll need is a container, something that's long to contain that foam. I also put down a, some measurements. If you don't have measurements already, you can use a measuring cup to help you with that. Uh, something to keep track of time, I'm using my cell phone as a stopwatch. I have a milk frother or a straw, either works. And then to jot down your uh, data, you need some paper. For this experiment, you're going to fill the container up with at least 100 milliliters of the liquid that you want to make bubbled or foam. 
The next thing, you're going to blow your bubbles or make your foam to at least two times the amount of volume that you have in liquid, in bubbles. Once you've gotten to the top amount of bubbles that you can make, then press start on the stopwatch, collect your data every 10 seconds. From this experiment, you will have collected some interesting data. You can take this data and plot it in any spreadsheet software. What do you think you will see? From my plot, you can see an exponential decrease of the foam or bubble over time. You can see where the half-life of our chocolate bubble is. This is very similar to the decay of carbon-14 and other radioisotopes. Since we know the half-life of radioisotopes like carbon-14, archaeologists can work backwards, calculating the artifact's age. So this process is called radiometric dating or carbon dating. So far, we've used carbon-14 as an example of a reliable radioisotope to date fossils. In truth, carbon-14 can be only used for relatively young or recent fossils, no greater than 7,000 years old. This is due to the fact that carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life. For every 5,730 years, the carbon-14 sample reduces by half. And after 12 cycles, there's so little carbon-14 left in the sample that it's impossible to detect. In order to detect older fossils though, scientists need to rely on other radioisotopes with longer half-lives. Two common isotopes are potassium-40 with a half-life of 1.3 billion years. And the other one is uranium-238 with a half-life of four and a half billion years. Paleontologists have to choose correct isotopes to figure out the fossil's absolute age. Today we learned about two different techniques scientists use to determine the age of fossils. We created a geological squeeze box to demonstrate the principles of stratification. We measured the half-life of things like bubbles and foam at home to demonstrate the nature of radioactive decay. Now it's your turn to take both experiments even further. What other materials can you add in the stratigraphy box? We only use dry materials, but what about wet materials? What would change about that? Can you add other solids in here in your container to mimic igneous intrusions? Or maybe even large boulders or fossils? What about here? What other liquids and foams can you measure the half-life of? Carbon, potassium, and uranium have different half-lives. Can you find things at home that also have different decay rates too? Can you graph them out and maybe compare them? For more information about the geological dating and experiments that we were talking about today, check out our companion documents in the link below. We would also love to see some of your experiments and results on our social media channels. Have fun with the experiments you can do at home and make sure you ask, test, and repeat. Thanks for watching.